Over the last two years, there has been an increased focus on the adage of wearing emotions on your sleeve for entrepreneurs. According to Forbes, the polling organization Opinium and the Center for Economic and Business Research, 92% of small business owners have experienced mental health problems within the last two years. Moa Bossi is a mindset and performance coach who helps successful entrepreneurs work through the parts of their lives w which are not bringing them fulfillment. Detecting their destructive habits and getting to the root of them in order for them to flourish in every aspect of their lives and making sure that they can maximize their business potential. So let's dial in and start the week on a positive note and get down to the nitty gritty of performing in business while managing our emotions successfully. With this in mind, I'm Kevin McShan. Let's have this conversation. take a moment to welcome you to the program and I'm super excited to learn how to help entrepreneurs succeed this morning. What a great uh, to see you this morning and happy uh, Canadian Tuesday my friend. I'm, I'm ready to start whenever you are. Absolutely. So Mo I know that you help entrepreneurs sort of uh, get through the emotions and uh, the parts of their lives that don't bring them uh, fulfillment so that they can succeed. And so I'm wondering if you can tell me about all of the work that you do, buddy. Yeah, so, I mean, I help a lot of entrepreneurs, also professionals, people who, um, you know, are in, are in high positions in their job, just getting rid of bad habits, getting rid of addictions, getting rid of um, negative thoughts, beliefs, emotions that are kind of not serving them so that they can really perform at the levels that they want to, whether it's at their jobs or their, their businesses. Yeah, absolutely. So let's dive into creating a good habits or getting rid of bad ones, but what do you think is the roadmap to get that done? Yeah, this is a good question. Um, with the first thing with wanting to do good habits, most of the time, you have to get rid of the bad ones that are causing you to not have the good ones. So for example, let's say you want to wake up early. Most people, the reason why they don't wake up early is not necessarily because they don't listen to their alarm clock, but because they sleep late. And so they get low amount of sleep and then they can't wake up early. So if you want to wake up early, you have to be willing to get rid of the bad habit, which is sleeping late. If you can get rid of sleeping late, then you're probably going to wake up early. So that's the first step is to understanding what's the bad habit behind the good habit that's stopping the good habit from happening. The second thing is getting to the root cause of the bad habit itself. Why are you doing it? What self-soothing mechanism is it causing for you so that you are partaking in that bad habit. We don't do bad habits for no reason. Usually there's a benefit to them. Usually we are doing them because it is helping us soothe ourselves in one way or another. So you might be sleeping late because you're staying up on social media because you feel bored and you don't like feeling bored and alone. And so therefore you have to get to that root cause of the emotional center 
to figure out why you're partaking in that bad habit in the first place. Once you get to that root cause and you understand what emotion is making you partake in that bad habit, you have to be willing to actually sit in the emotion. You have to accept the emotion. You have to expect the emotion and everything that comes with it and allow it to pass. Of course, meditation is super helpful in these instances, yoga, stretching, doing something where you can just sit in the emotion and express it without trying to resist it will allow you to not necessarily partake in that bad habit. So that's the general overview. Um, but yeah, the most important thing with having good habits is making sure what are the bad ones behind them that's stopping the good habit from happening. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, no, I know you have adopted something called the Three Stage Roadmap. So I'm wondering if you can tell me about it, but I didn't want it's all about. Sure. Um, the Three Cs is kind of what I figured out over the last two, three, four years. Um, as I went on this journey, I used to have a multi six figure business, but I felt absolutely miserable and I felt unhappy. I was depressed. I was anxious. I had multiple panic attacks, two of which that led me to the hospital. And so I felt terrible and I was wondering like, what the hell do I do to actually overcome this? How can I overcome my self sabotage? How can I overcome these negative emotions and anxiety and depression and so on and so forth? And I tried the traditional therapy route with going to like a cognitive behavioral therapist and it was really helpful, but nothing actually sticked long term. And uh, there's a good book that I actually have here. It's called uh, The Body uh, The Body Keeps the Score. And it talks about certain traumas. And one thing it says is that when you have uh, traumas, it actually shuts down the part of your brain where you want to communicate about them. So this is why a lot of traditional therapies don't work that well, because it's hard to communicate your traumas. It's hard to actually open up about them. And so I found that it wasn't super effective for me um, long term. It was definitely a catalyst for me to go on the journey to kind of figuring this out. Um, and so I spent a lot of money, traveled all over the place, worked with top level experts and doctors and so on and so forth. And I found out what I call the three C's, which is um, clarity, conditioning and consciousness. And so usually when I work with someone, the first three weeks, we're getting very, very clear on what they actually want. What's the end result? What's their values? What's their vision? What's their standards? What's their boundaries in life? Then conditioning is actually reconditioning the mind and the thought patterns so that they don't constantly put themselves in a negative state. They don't constantly put themselves in bad habits and self-sabotage and so on and so forth. And then last step is consciousness. So this is the deep identity work to get them to stick with things long term. A huge reason why people constantly fall back into their old patterns is because it's just not a part of who they are. It's not a part of their identity. If I were to ask you today to go and... I don't know, uh, do something illegal, right? I, I told you, here's a gun, go rob a store. What would you tell me? You would say, no, right? You would say, no, I'm not doing that. And the reason why you wouldn't do that is because it's not a part of who you are. It's not a part of your identity as a human being. And so a lot of times, if we want something to stick long-term, it has to be a part of our consciousness. It has to be a part of who we believe we are at our core. And so that's where the identity work comes in so that everything that you do sticks long term and it becomes effortless. It's not something that you have to use your willpower on. Yeah. And, and Mo, I know that your upbringing yourself uh, contributes to the work that you're doing now. So tell me about that and how you think trauma affects entrepreneurs on a larger scale. Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think that most entrepreneurs that I've talked to and I've worked with are traumatized. They're, they're, it's why they're entrepreneurs in the first place. 
Um, they have something to prove to themselves or other people, whatever it may be. The problem is they're going into it hoping that they can get rid of their traumas by making more money or by creating a bigger impact, whatever their entrepreneur journey is. And they think that that is going to solve their inner problems. They think that that is going to make them happy and do all of these things. And that's what I thought when I first started my entrepreneur journey. Um, but once you make money and you do all the things that you wanted to do, you realize money only solves money problems. It doesn't solve inner problems. It only accentuates who you already are. And so if you're already a traumatized person, you're going to even feel more traumatized with more money. If you're an anxious person, you're going to feel more anxious with more money. If you are uh, an unhappy person, you're going to feel more unhappy. And so the problem is that entrepreneurs are on this chase of more, more, more. And they're doing it because they think it's going to solve their inner problems. Oftentimes, they never get to that more, more, more because they haven't solved the inner problems. And if they do, it just accentuates their inner problems. Yeah, absolutely. And Mo, you know, I also wanted to ask you about uh, the societal pressure that entrepreneurs are under, you know, after COVID and after uh, going through that from a psychological and emotional standpoint. A lot of entrepreneurs went under simply because their business didn't uh, respond after the, the pandemic or they couldn't handle the societal pressures. You're talking to me about uh, the societal pressure. Do you believe that entrepreneurs are under just succeed? And how do you think they can effectively manage that in order to manage both their business and their life as well? Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and it's a really tough question. I mean, a lot of businesses did go under during COVID, and it's very unfortunate. I think that uh, I think COVID exposed a lot of businesses, and it exposed um, how a lot of businesses weren't prepared with their cash flow, they weren't prepared with their performance, they weren't prepared to deal with something like this for for the low end of the the business cycle and of course covid was very special um i don't know i would just tell an entrepreneur like you know you have to prepare for these things you have to start to get smart with your accounting and your money and really prepare for the worst case scenario what if you're you know you can't run your store or what if you can't do this like what will you do then um will you go online you have to the entrepreneur always has to innovate and think of solutions outside of the box and not just accept things that are thrown at them or just live paycheck to paycheck with their money. Um, they have to be willing to put some aside and treat it like a real business so that if things get bad, they're able to support themselves. And um, yeah, but it's tough. I, I don't really know the answer to this question because it's COVID was very special and a lot of businesses did go under I always say the only way you can really fail is by giving up. And so if an entrepreneur is watching this and they went through COVID and so on and so forth, um, you know, start something new, like get yourself back up and do what's necessary. Get a job, get, make some more money, pay off your debts, whatever you can do, keep going forward. Um, don't sit there. Don't look backwards. Just keep going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to uh, dive into the concept of inclusion in this sense, my friend. You know, I was born with cerebral palsy, but and the type of cerebral palsy that I was born with is called a spastic quadriplegia. Simply means that I don't have enough oxygen in my legs to walk normally. But I've dedicated part of my adult life to helping businesses to see the positive benefits of hiring folks with disabilities. So from that sense, how do you think uh, the, the concept of inclusion of all voices can help entrepreneurs succeed? I think it can help tremendously. I, I think, um, you know, for, for the most part, society in general, unfortunately, sees people who have 
um, disabilities is not being able to do the job as good as other people. And it's just not true. Um, oftentimes, you know, they'll do the job even better, if anything, if, if because they want to prove that they can do the job. So I think it's extremely important. I think that there should be inclusion of all color, all cultures, um, all backgrounds, um, all genders. It really is dependent, not so much on the person and, you know, all their stuff, but is more dependent on whether they can get the job done. I th think more entrepreneurs should look objectively and see whether the person can perform, not just for their color or not just for their disability or not just for their gender and so on and so forth. Because um, that way you hire the best people that you can. Uh, it's based on solely on performance. It's based solely on objectivity, not your own subjective beliefs. Yeah, absolutely. And to that point, well, I'm, I'm curious to ask you about creating a competitive advantage and how you think uh, entrepreneurs can maximize their opportunities to do that. To create a competitive advantage, I think the competitive advantage outside of anything tactical, like learning, you know, marketing, learning, um, whatever, sales, so on and so forth, um, those are tactical things. And I think all entrepreneurs, they can consistently invest into those things to learn more about it, of course. Um, but the entrepreneur who reinvests the money into the business regularly, more than their competition, and is performing consistently at a high level is going to have the upper hand, meaning that their performance isn't inconsistent day in, day out, where one day they're very productive, one day they're not, and they don't work as much, and you know their emotions are all over the place, and so on and so forth. The person who can honestly operate like a robot, where they're very consistent emotionally, they're very consistent with their hours, they're very consistent with their daily focus and performance and productivity, is always going to have the upper hand uh, above their competition. Yeah, absolutely. And, well, I want to talk to you about business burnout because you know, uh, you, you know, on average, when you first start a start a business, I think the stat was entrepreneurs work between eighty to one hundred hours a week, and, uh, and they don't sort of uh, take a time to uh, sort of reset themselves. So I'm Curious to ask you about business burnout and how do you think we can avoid business burnout as entrepreneurs? Um, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs work 80 to 100 hours a week because they've been told to just hustle, hustle, hustle. And you might even grow a business really fast that way, but it's not sustainable. And um, they'll do these 80, 100 hours a week, but really only about... 30 hours of the uh, of the hours that they're putting in is actually productive meaning they're producing at a very very high level i've found for myself in my own journey after about six hours my work becomes sloppy my work becomes less focused my work becomes like very half-assed and sure you can still work half-assed and you know work another eight hours when in reality you're getting another like four hours of work because it's, you know, at half the pace. Um, and technically you're getting more work done, but it's just not sustainable in the long term because once you burn out and you feel like crap, you stop working and you're not as consistent with your output. And then your whole 16 hours that you're putting in is like only putting in like two hours of work. So over time, if we're thinking in the long scale of things, you're actually putting in the same hours, but you're just more miserable and more burnt out. So you might as well do consistent six hours a day working on your business. Now, this goes more so for, for businesses who aren't trying to be the next Elon Musk. Okay, they aren't trying to start up the next Tesla and the next... Um, you know, SpaceX. I, I think for those businesses, you probably are going to have to sacrifice your entire life. You are going to have to put 80 to 100 hours a week 
And you have to be a different breed. You have to be someone like Elon Musk who wakes up, breathes his ideas and like eats his ideas and sleeps with his ideas. Like you have to be that person. But if you're not, you want to just build a freedom business or build a even decent sized business. Um, I think consistency matters more and like you can build a good business four to six hours a day and still enjoy your life and still not feel burnt out. Yeah, and since you brought it up uh, more than once, I'll ask you about business consistency and how you define that term. I think consistency is, is the hours that you're putting in and your productivity within those hours. So if I'm putting in six hours a day, every day consistently, and I'm not getting distracted, and I'm not on my phone, and I'm not have, you know doing X, Y, Z, that to me is as consistent as a person can be. Yeah, and you uh, brought up earlier the idea of therapies for entrepreneurs, and not all therapies work the same, same way for all people. So I'm curious to ask you about the role you think therapies play, and what therapies you think uh, are good for people to explore on a broader scale while knowing that not all therapies work for all people? Um, again, I think therapy is super helpful. I'm an advocate for therapy. Um, so, I, I mean, when I bring this up, I think people think I, I don't like therapy. I, I really do. I think it's a catalyst for actually, you know, solving a lot of inner wounds, inner issues. Um, and especially doing it in an environment with a professional, not just like a random person. So I, I do believe in therapy. I just don't think that it's a long-term solution. I think it gets you started on your self-development journey, but it's not going to fix you know, your deepest problems, um, specifically cognitive behavioral therapy. I think a lot of people start with cognitive behavioral therapy and they need to actually end with cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a talk therapy. You have to be willing to talk about your problems. And if you're a traumatized individual, w when they've done studies like brain imaging studies, they found out that trauma is actually... Um, cut off the part of the brain that deals with language and deals with logic. And so oftentimes when you're recalling traumas, it's actually harder to express your ideas and talk about them and open up your about your emotions and really just solve your inner problems. So cognitive behavioral therapy is probably the worst place to start if you have traumas. It's the last place to finish. Um, I think uh, EMDR is probably going to be the most helpful. Hypnotherapy was the most helpful um, for me personally, dealing with anxiety and um, panic attacks. It's the only form of therapy that actually worked for getting rid of my anxiety. So hypnotherapy, EMDR, I'm a huge fan of uh, those two types. Um, but yeah, you're going to have to do some soul searching and you're going to have to figure out some some methods outside of traditional therapy to see what works for you. Yeah, I mean, when we examine the, the concept of uh, self-sabotage, uh, avoiding that, that how do the entrepreneurs can uh, sort of get out of their own way, for lack of a better term, and then and sort of, sort of avoid that feeling of self-sabotage? Yeah, self-sabotage is... Um is often linked with either self-soothing. So you're doing something that you know you shouldn't be doing, but it feels good in the moment. So whether the entrepreneur is smoking too much or drinking too much or using too much social media, so on and so forth, they're doing it because there's a certain emotional issue that they have that they're not solving at its core and it feels good in the moment to just watch too much TV or play video games or... Uh, scroll on social media and do X, Y, Z, right? Um, so that's one way. It's like getting down to the emotional root cause of it. The other reason entrepreneurs will self-sabotage is because they have certain beliefs that don't allow them to surpass a certain level. So for example, let's say you've grown up in a home where 
your parents have told you that rich people are, are assholes. And you've been told this over and over again. Rich people are terrible people. Rich people are not good people. But you want to become rich. The chances of that happening is very low because every time you are about to make strides forward to become that quote-unquote rich person, your, your belief is going to hold you back and you're going to do something to either waste a lot of money, um, get rid of money, so on and so forth, because you don't want to be a rich person subconsciously because you know if you do you won't be accepted by your parents or your family or your quote-unquote tribe it's like well if rich people are terrible people well i don't want to be rich because then they're going to think i'm a terrible person and so self-sabotage is comes in two forms one is through the beliefs the second is oftentimes through um you know certain emotional problems that are showing up that you're not dealing with yeah, absolutely. And well, tell me your thoughts on, on the concept of resiliency, because you know, as an entrepreneur, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, tell you that that it's not always easy to sort of dig in the well of resiliency. So tell me, how do you view resiliency on a larger scale, and how do you define the term? Um. I define resiliency as the ability to deal with challenges um, consistently and do it easier every single time. You want to become a more resilient person, you're going to have to be resilient, more and more resilient as time goes on. It's like, it's just like lifting weights, right? If I lift a 10 pound dumbbell, and the next week I go in and try to lift the 10 pound dumbbell, it's going to be a little bit easier. And so I want to up the weight. I want to go to a 15 pound dumbbell and then the next week, 20 pound dumbbell. And so resiliency works very similar. Uh, I think an entrepreneur has to be resilient. Like if you are not a resilient person, um, which you can become a resilient person again, similar to lifting weights, but it, if you're not even willing to learn how to be resilient, or don't want to deal with anything that requires resiliency, you're not going to be an entrepreneur. You have to deal with a lot of pain as an entrepreneur, um, a lot of emotional pain, a lot of um, stress, a lot of things coming up consistently that you're going to have to deal with. It's inevitable. And so if you don't want to deal with anything that requires resiliency, uh, then you're probably not fit to be an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur wants to create something for the world and is often doing so at the cost of his own peace of mind or peace of life even. Um, and sometimes it's it, that's something you're going to have to battle and deal with all the time. And this is why I started my business teaching this because I think um, you can deal with it a lot less than most entrepreneurs are dealing with right now. Um, cause a lot of it is self-conflicted pain, but yeah, if you're not willing to deal with anything that requires resiliency, it's better to actually just have a job. And I think most people should have a job. Like having a job is not a bad thing. It does not mean that, you know, you're a slave or whatever, like these entre online entrepreneurs are saying about people. It's like, no man, have a job. It's, it's a good thing. Like you're getting paid. You have a balanced life where you might work nine to five and then you get to enjoy the rest of your life. It's not a bad thing. And so you have to figure out what kind of person you are. Yeah. Yeah, everything comes in balance, absolutely. And Ma, I'm, building on that, I'm curious to, uh, with, uh, to ask you about the concept of prosperity and how you view achieving prosperity and also sustaining it, whether it be in business or in life as well. Uh, prosperity. Prosperity is a, these are great questions, by the way, like it's making me think very deeply about these things. Um, prosperity is very subjective. I mean, you'll go to parts of the world where you might not think someone is prosperous living in a first world country. And to, to them, you know, that's prosperity. I think prosperity is dependent on 
cultural influence on societal influence. It's dependent on subjective influence and what you believe prosperity is and what you believe prosperity is growing up. Um, so that's a really hard question to answer because it's very dependent on person to person, culture to culture, country to country. I think prosperity for me personally is freedom. And I think having freedom to do what you want um, when you want with who you want is ultimate prosperity. And that does not necessarily mean that you never work and you never, you know, you're just traveling all like that gets boring really quick if you're not working and not doing something creative, but freedom to do what you truly want when you want and with who you want is what I think is ultimate life prosperity. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Mo, I always say that everyone's portrait of success is different, isn't it? Yeah, everyone's portrait of success is different, yeah. So, yeah, Mo, I want to have fun with you, buddy. I know that uh, fitness is a big part of your life and, and helping other people maximize their fitness potential as well. and. So when you're not working, why do you value fitness so much? And how else do you find your inner center in life when, ever, when your walls of life are crashing in on you, buddy? How do you recenter yourself? Um, to recenter myself really comes down to a few things. Like, uh, this is a very deep question. I can go like two hours on this, but I'll try to make it short. Um, yeah, fitness is a huge part of my life. I wouldn't say it's the biggest part of my life, uh, but it definitely does make me just feel good. Like yesterday, you know, I went to the gym um, around 12 p.m. And then around 6 p.m., I went to one hour boxing class. So I'm very active. My mind is constantly working. And if I don't tire out my body, it's very difficult for me to to shut my mind off. And so um, fitness is a huge part. I work out sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day. Like I'm just, uh, I'm very active. Um, but to recenter myself mentally, the, the one practice that is the easiest to do without going into super detail about like, you know, my processes and stuff, but this is something people can do at home for free is Vipassana meditation. It is single-handedly the best form of meditation you can do to come back to the present, to come back to center. Um, it is, yeah, it, it's the one thing that I will always use whenever I feel like things are too hectic is Vipassana meditation. Yeah, but it, it's important to find uh, the space in life to really reconnect with yourself, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so, Mo, I know we both live in Canada, buddy, so tell me about what's the best part about living and being Canadian, my friend? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, beautiful country, lots of nature, um, plenty of amazing food, uh, the fact that everything is multicultural and you can enjoy Indian food and then one day you can join enjoy Jamaican food and one day you can enjoy Persian food I'm a big foodie so uh, I, I like the fact that uh, there's a lot of options out here and of course uh, the aspect of freedom as well just being able to live in a country where there's democratic processes and so on and so forth um, political views aside and uh, the fact that majority of humans here are living a good life and you know have access to clean water and food and things that we should be grateful for but we tend to take for granted yeah absolutely but my final question for you this morning has to do with your own personal and professional legacy and how you want that to be defined how i want that to be defined um i've had this question before and i don't think that I don't think that legacy necessarily matters in the way that most people want it to matter. Most people 
want their legacy to d- be defined as this like successful thing that they created in the world and they're known forever as the best and so on. It's very, to me, egocentric. When in reality, once you die, like people are going to forget you in anywhere from three to six months and they're going to move on with their life. And so for me, the, the most important thing is that my legacy was defined by someone who was kind to other people and who was uh, improving not only his life, but other people's lives. But I also, within my professional life, within my business, I really want to get my processes out to as many people without having to, um, like right now I have a coaching program. It's, of course, very expensive and not a lot of people can afford my coaching program. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way where I can get my processes out to people for, you know, $10, for $15, and they can go through a self-journaling process and a self-healing process throughout uh, a journal or a book or something like that so that everyone can have access to these processes. Because I think, especially in today's um, society, a lot of people are suffering. They're, they're suffering from mental illnesses and anxiety and depression and um, panic attacks more than ever before. Um, because of social media apps and so on and so forth. And so I want to get that out to as many people as possible so that they can heal. Yeah, absolutely. And go follow and tell me if people want to get connected with you, buddy, what's the best way they can do that? Um, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, you know, they can just search up my name, M-O-E-A-B-B-A-S-S-I. I'm pretty much on all platforms, so YouTube, uh, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, whatever works for them, they can find me on there. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for uh, your work in the space of helping entrepreneurs uh, maximize their business and personal potential, and I want to uh, thank you for uh, joining me this morning. Your work in the space and time on my behalf is most appreciated, and I want to thank you for being here today, Bonnie. Thank you so much for having me, brother.